you. See, finally I could teach you something. That doesn't happen very often. <laughs> yeah, no, normally I'm just like, I'm totally going to just hit record. So um, real quick. So I'm going to, you know, I'm well, gonna well, this is, this is pre-show it. bullshit, I guess. So real quick, uh, building a memory palace. Uh, I think I, I thought a lot of people knew about the concept of a memory palace, of a mind palace. Uh, and yet anytime I bring it up in conversation, it, I, I met with like, I have two heads. So a mind palace is basically a technique to store information and retrieve it at will. Because, I mean, we've discussed this metaphor at length, I won't beat it to death, but humans are basically just organic computers and machines to some degree, subject to the laws of physics and chemistry and everything else. But you can also store information very easily using memory pegs, mnemonics, and mind palace, which is basically a combination of memory pegs and mnemonics. Now, mnemonics is just using kind of like cues um, to help you remember things. So there's a lot of very obvious examples, but say you needed to remember uh, somebody's name, you would just make the person, I, I don't know, give me a name, somebody's name. Oh, your name, Mary. Marie, sorry, Marie. So um, <laughs> instead of Marie, I would make it, because um, your name is Mary Asplin. So I would say um, Mary Asplin. And that's how I would remember your name. It's It sounds funny, but what I'm getting for a mental image is you literally on like a ping pong paddle is, is what I'm getting in my head. And I'm just gonna store it like that. It's a ridiculous image, but if I had trouble remembering your name, I would bring up the image and boom, I got it. That's just a simple mnemonic. It's simple thing. Uh, oh, so you use a visual cue to remember someone's cool. name. And this is I could need gonna... that because I'm more visual, but I am not auditory. And I think mm. it's because I'm bilingual too. When I learn English, like I can't listen to someone. I have to have them like, I mean, I listen, but then they have to write it down. Well, there's actually a really easy way to tell your best way of learning. It's um, get a stopwatch, just set a minute on it and then hit start. And as the minute's ticking down, don't look at it at all, but just count in your head one, two, three, at whatever cadence is best for you. It, it doesn't need to match seconds. Your objective is not to match the seconds. Your okay. objective is to do this a couple of times in a row. When I do this, my second count is 52. So when this when, when I count to 52, this is at 60. And okay. that's pretty much every single time that I test myself. It's 52 or 53 or 51. So it's, again, it's not accurate. I'm not- And what does correct. that tell you? I'm going to get to it. Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> so now- <laughs> Now, when I do this, what I envision in my head is every time I go one, two, three, four, I'm seeing colorful birthday candles alternating with black and white candles like you'd see on mailboxes. And those are the numbers going one, two, three in visual representation. That's how I count. When I get into the numbers, they either get a frozen color, or like a moss coating or like a fire on them or something. So that's how I visually count numbers in my head. Now, without using a timer, I can just count one, two, three, four, five, and I can keep doing that. And while I'm doing that, I can do other things. So for example, in my case, I can also speak to somebody while still counting. I'm able to do that. However, somebody who's an auditory learner, when they're counting in their head, they don't have a visual representation they have something else, some other process at hand going on auditorily in their head. They have a voice perhaps speaking one, two, and on a repeat in their head, but there's no visual representation. So that person, for example, would probably be able to read a book and also count in their head at the same time. I'm not able to do that because the part of my brain responsible for visual stuff is being used. I can't read a book and count at the same time, but I can read a book and like exercise at the same time. I can read a book and I, I'm sorry, I can um, I can count in my head and exercise at the same time. You get the idea. So that's a really quick and easy way to determine what kind of a learner you are, actually. But anyways, back to memory. I don't even know who I am. Like I, know, I don't right? do. I don't do either. I don't think of well, anything. Again, you, there's there's different kinds. But again, well, another time. So back to the memory palace, though. So here's what a memory palace is. It's a system for remembering information and then recalling it at will. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'll take you to my first memory palace and you'll understand how it goes. I'll, I'll give you literally the first ever attempt I made at a memory palace. The first thing you have to do is choose an environment you're very familiar with. So I literally used my apartment. Of course, I'm very familiar with my apartment. So I'm sitting in the middle of my apartment. I chose my living room. So I mentally looked around my living room. 
close my eyes. Do I remember it? A couple of times, a couple of times till I can remember the living room, the colors of the couch, the colors of the wall, et cetera, the general shape of it. You get the idea. It's, it's not that hard. You just do it a few times, you got it. Once you've got it, select a couple objects in the room. So in my case, I selected the door, which led outside, the wine rack. I had a, a wine rack right next to the door. The, I had a big like bucket table in the middle of the room, a dark board, and then I had a, an ax on the wall. And um, so those were the objects in the living room that I chose. Now, I chose those for memory pegs. So those objects are now going to be represented as special objects in the room. So they hold a special place. So what I want, I first tried to remember was my grocery list for Publix. Literally, that was my first memory attempt. I'm going to tell you what it was and how I did it. Number one on the list was bacon. Why do I remember that? It's because I wrapped my door in bacon, large, giant pieces of bacon, and they were all crispy and bubbling. And that's what I did in my brain. Okay. Second thing I needed was eggs. So I put chickens in the wine rack with their butts out, pooping out eggs, right? So it's ridiculous, it's silly, it sticks. The third thing I needed was water bottles. So I needed cases of water. So in the barrel, I just envisioned myself throwing a bunch of water bottles, like just throwing it, because I wanted to remember water bottles. Third thing I needed was liquid detergent. <laughs> I envisioned myself throwing detergent all over my couch, just in a big blue wave across the couch, so I wouldn't forget the detergent. Uh, the next thing I wanted to buy was bananas. So I envisioned opening up my dartboard. It was a, a cabinet one and a bunch of little runts bananas falling out. So I would remember the, the bananas. And the final thing was uh, protein powder. So I envisioned myself taking my ax and chopping down a giant tub of protein powder to get the powder inside. And again, this was 12, 13 years ago, 14 years ago, something. And I still remember it and everything else that I've put in those places since then. You can keep reusing the memory pegs over and over. You can use it uh, like magicians use this to remember large amounts of numbers. Chess players use it to remember plays, etc. I use it to store information about anatomy and respiratory health and stuff. But you get the idea. It's very simple. Very simple concept, right? Very simple. Well, you're looking like it's not. I mean... <laughs> Okay, so let's try. Let's try. I together. just let's realized try. that I don't think I am not even aware at all. Like something is, <laughs> I'm not using this part. Okay, apparently. let's do this. Let's do. It. We're gonna we're gonna make a baby. Or we're gonna make a baby memory palace. Okay, I'm serious. I'm gonna test you at the end of the podcast. Okay, so right now you're at your desk. Mm -hmm. All right, three objects on your desk that have special value to you. Mm -hmm. What are they? Oh, <laughs> yeah, what are they? Um, a picture of uh, me and my sister, and my brother, sitting on a table when we were kids. What's the picture frame? There's no frame. I just stuck it on the wall with a piece of tape. Okay, got it. Next, a plant. Okay, plant. Next, a uh, crystal. Crystal. I, I could have guessed those two. <laughs> you don't even believe it. <laughs> okay, so... Um, oh, this is going to be so much fun. <laughs> I don't know. Pick uh, three random things from the grocery store that you need to buy. Whatever. Just three things you need to remember to buy. Um, okay. Okay. Whatever. Okay. T well, tell me. This isn't a psychic reading. Just tell me. <laughs> Onions. Onions. <laughs> Avocados. Avocado. And what do I need to buy? Eggs. Eggs, cool. Okay, here's what we're going to do. And the plant, see the plant? Mm -hmm. You know how onions grow from a single bulb, right? You've seen that before, I'm sure. All right, see the plant? Mm hmm See the plant with onions growing out of it, choking the life from your plant and claiming it as their own. Green onion shoots, taking it over slowly, withering away the plant that's there. Can you put that in your brain? Mm -hmm. All right. And then eventually they're going to turn into giant bulbous onions. Okay, we got that? Mm -hmm. See them poking out of the dirt. See them choking the life from your plant. See the green shoots spiking up to the ceiling. So sad. I know, but it's going to help you remember. All right. What else we got? Avocados. 
All right, avocados, the picture of you, your sister, and everybody else on the wall. I want you to picture yourself throwing avocados at it in a fit of rage. <laughs> okay. You. Okay. Picture yourself throwing avocados at it in a picture. Ah, and you're turning the floor into guacamole, okay? All right. <laughs> Big old mashed potatoes of avocado, right? And we need eggs, all right? We got a crystal. You come up with the last one. Mm, I'm going to balance an egg on that crystal. You're going to balance an egg perfectly on the crystal. Make sure it's an ostrich egg, okay? Mm -hmm. Ostrich egg balanced on top of the crystal. If it falls, the world it's like ends. the crystal ball. It's going to become the crystal ball. The egg is yes. just going to have this the radiant light. Exactly. Okay, cool. We got it. So we got the three things. Now let's get into the posture podcast. So yes. <laughs> hello and welcome to, what was it? What is this one again? I forget the name. Healthy conversations. Healthy conversations. Oh, that's the one. I'm sorry. That that's also a mentally healthy conversation. But welcome, guys, to healthy conversations with Coach Castle. And I'm joined once again by Marie digging into her specialty today on posture. <laughs> welcome back. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, after spending a few weeks with you, I think we need to change that and say it's kind of your specialty. So <laughs> I'm <laughs> learning a few things that I may have to uh, change in my approach to get reevaluate which is a good thing yes but I have a few thoughts that I haven't shared with you so we'll Go we'll on. get into a conversation I love it well first things first um please a brief explanation of what you do and then perhaps uh just some simple uh like real life stories would be great all right um, so what I do for the last two decades working with people to restore mainly their posture, but posture to me is the foundation to overall health and wellness. So I have a degree in biomedical science, came from medical research, changed my career, went back to school for massage therapy, became a manual therapist, and also personal trainer. And then over the last 15 years, I've specialized in structural integration and alignment and functionality. That's why I appreciate your training so much, because that's what your focus is. Healthiest and possible version of yourself, yes. What's that? The healthiest possible version of yourself and the yes. most efficient way possible too. And it can I mean, I was very anatomically and physiologically focused when I first started. It actually started with my knee injury that I mentioned to you back in 1999 and 2000. I lived in New Zealand for a year. And I, didn't I know you then. No. Oh, I'm, just, okay. I'm just kidding. Yes. You said you mentioned it to me. I'm sorry. And then you said that. Like... Okay. So I lived there for a year and I put myself in the mountains and I did a three day trekking. I was not prepared. I am one of those. I throw myself into situations <laughs> without thinking. So I didn't have any camping gear, nothing. So I started off in flip flops and it was 70 miles over three days. And uh, long story short, I found myself with this stabbing knee pain going, descending, it started to kick in. I was a runner at the time. I was working out like six days a week, twice a day, you know, kind of that in my 20s. Um, so then I got this knee injury and that put me on the path of figuring it out because I seeked help through medical practitioners, through acupuncturists, PTs, you name it, I did it nobody could help me so I'm like well I have to help myself and that's where I got into I've always been focused on fitness and strength but that's what I learned so much that knee problems stem from hip problems and also the foot alignment right that we have talked so long story short that's when I really got motivated to fix myself and became obsessive <laughs> to the point where my friends, if we would go on vacation, I would bring my anatomy book and they're like, hey, it's time to relax. I'm like, I'm having fun. I'm yeah, reading about the human right? body. So I love the human body. I find it so fascinating. And that's why I appreciate you so much because you, you have this mind and you just go in depth about it, right? So fast forward again, I moved to America 2004 to do my PhD and decided that I don't want to spend my life in a lab. I want to work with people and their bodies and actually help them feel better, not develop drugs to make them sicker. So I wanted to um, work through movement. Movement is medicine, in my opinion, and also just lifestyle habits. And I think we've removed ourselves so far from what healthy living means 
and we've become so sedentary. We've lost proprioception. We've lost the ability to move. Kids move freely. And as we get older, we acquire um, more sedentary lifestyles and we lose that mobility. And I think mobility, flexibility is key for vitality and longevity and also just quality of life and how we age. And I hate this saying is, you know, you go doctor, you have a pain or whatever it is. And the doctor's like, yeah, you're just getting old and you're in your thirties. And like, I'm not getting old, you know? So I hate that when I meet people and I have clients accepting that they are in pain, they're accepting that they're gaining weight, they're accepting that they're depressed. And all there is, is that it's an imbalance. So when it comes to posture, right, it's an imbalance. There's tightness that needs to be to be um, released and restored. And then there's weaknesses that needs to be strengthened. So I always look at that. So when I went through school, right, for personal training and massage therapist, I'm, I'm that annoying student <laughs> that no. questions everything. No. I'm a critical thinker. Yeah, you know, I'm impatient. And I'm like, why do we no. do this? So in massage, it's so frustrating to me because if you go for body work, if you don't go to a qualified professional that actually has the intention to restore balance in your body, they just go through the sequence, right? They treat the right side, the left side, the same. And to me, postural awareness is asymmetrical work. You have to, it's like a puzzle. So I don't know if this is like my, my eyes go to, and we've talked about that when we see people, right? We go mm. to anatomy, bones, muscles. Like I don't see a man or a woman. I don't see age. I just see functionality, right? So when I was little, I would lay puzzles really fast. Like I just see alignment. I see lines. Um, I'm very artistic. So I can kind of like, it's just something that I see naturally, but it's hard to see in yourself, right? You can see it in others, but you don't necessarily see everything in yourself. Uh, again, which is why I appreciate you because I know you have those eyes. So now you can coach me, right? From that perspective. I got the predator vision. That I see the multiple layers of crap. layers yeah and <laughs> but that kind of takes away from seeing people like people though sometimes it is hard to take a step back people ask it's why very I clinical so weed, but that's why sometimes it's very clinical and people have asked me that it's that hard to treat bodies i'm like no i just don't see the person i see their tissues and mm. they look at me like i have two heads and i'm like i just see tissues and from a manual perspective it's more three-dimensional and then the movement kinesiology is a different, right? So then I combine the two. So when I was working as a trainer and then I had my massage practice, that's when I realized those clients that saw me for both saw the fastest results. Because with manual therapy, you can go into the tissues and literally manipulate the tissues, right? And then with corrective exercise and movement, you can now change movement patterns. And you can make them aware of how they move on a day-to-day -day basis. Same with breath work that you are big on. When you unlock, and we can talk about that because we've obviously, you have opened my eyes to a different way of breathing and I've taught another way. And now learning that I have even more to learn, which is kind of the story of my life. I constantly dive deeper. And again, so grateful that I met you because now you've added layers to my already existing knowledge right now i can go deeper and learn something new and for me growth is like food for my soul so when i continue to learn i get very stimulated very motivated very like alive and so my story when um when i, when I saw that my clients saw the best benefits that was when I opened the very first wellness center in Boston with posture as a focus. This is 13 years ago. And people were like, you're crazy. Like they like posture. Like it was, it's like, so not sexy. It's so not fun. You know, everything is geared towards loose weight, look a certain way, you know, like the fitness. Well, if, if I may actually interrupt is actually the, the vast majority of culture is actually counter good posture in all regards, actually. The, the, oh the, yeah. I mean, just very briefly, um, uh, high heels, waist trainers, uh, anything that women wear that is tight and constricting, anything that a man wears that is tight and constricting, um, if you see a pretty guy or a girl walk by, what do you do? You suck in your belly, you puff up your chest. Yeah. You do, all, all of these things are bad for posture. Sitting at a slouched angle, the kyphosis, the increased lumbar lordosis. I mean, 
But uh, I just very briefly, again, very briefly, in summary, a simple way to understand this, guys, and most of you are aware of this, is your body is kind of a mechanical machine. Mm -hmm. And you have muscles, and this is how you move, is your muscles pull you around. Muscles pull in a straight line, and muscles literally only pull in a straight line if the skeletal muscle. Skeletal is responsible for body movement. If it's outside of that straight line, it's a different muscle group. It's fairly easy to understand. All muscles pull, no muscles push. So it's very simple, just guys with ropes throughout your whole body, pulling and moving you. Once you've got that knowledge, you have to understand that due to this nature of the human body, it's very balanced tensile structure, you need to have equal muscles strength, let's say, on opposing muscle groups. So for every action, there is a reaction. And for every way for me to lift my finger, there's a way for me to lower my finger. Those are, are opposing muscle groups. For my bicep lifting, the tricep pulls it down. The bicep pulls up and the tricep pulls down. Mm -hmm. The front deltoid pulls the arm forward. The rear deltoid pulls it backwards. The pectorals pull the upper arm bone towards the sternum, the center of the chest. The middle and lower trapezius pull my arm and scapula back towards my spine. These are opposing muscle groups. If you train these muscle groups properly and they're equal strength and there's no muscle imbalances, which hopefully there's not if you're training correctly, you'll mostly have good posture. Adding to that correct respiratory breathing and a few cues and a few things you're going to talk about in just a minute, you'll have very easily accessible good posture. The only downside is most people don't have this simplistic take on things of training equal parts of your body equally. They, they don't think about muscles in those terms. They don't think about the human body as being a tensile structure as opposed to a compressive structure, which it's not. Mm -hmm. Think about it, guys. Your bones, they might be very wet, but they never touch each other. They're held suspended in a very intricate lattice work, like a tensile suspension bridge, but incredibly more complex. And it's it needs to be evenly balanced. Now, when that balance is compromised, i.e., you sit slumped forward for a prolonged period of time, for example, your abdominals will become permanently contracted. So your lower rib cage is going to be permanently pulled closer towards your pelvis over time, as well as your fascia, which is kind of like the second skin, which encompasses your muscle, which is very important. I'm sure you'll talk about that. And your erector spinal or the muscles of your back, they're going to become overstretched and over lengthened, and that fascia is going to become weakened. So this is why people get that slump forward, hunched back look, the chin goes forward to compensate, et cetera. You don't want that to happen to you. And it's as simple as training opposing muscle groups. I'll, I'll shut up now. Sorry, back to you. I hope you guys are enjoying this episode so far, and thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and comment, as it does help the channel a lot. And of course, subscribe if you haven't already. No, I love it. I love this. And I'm so glad you brought up. I'll get into a little bit more detail. Like I wrote down a few things on how I view posture and what to look for and different curvatures in the spine and so forth. And I can do a little demo of that. But I love how you brought up tight fitting clothing. Because this is something like for women bras, like mm. I do not wear bras for a reason, because I think that it constricts so much around the rib cage and it affects their breathing pattern. And now, it, if, yeah, I just have to, this is not transmitted enough. And it, it's best if I definitely say this on a podcast with a female, as opposed to saying this solo. Um, but wearing bras, there's definitely a time and a place, ladies, um, but you yeah. actually want to try to avoid it. The reason for this is if you're wearing a bra, literally think about it like a muscle. So if you're wearing a bra, your boobs don't have to do any work to support themselves and keep themselves firm and keep themselves upright. The bra does that for them, so they atrophy. And the mm -hmm. I won't get into it, but the, the network within them literally atrophies and deteriorates. Mm -hmm. That's why you get you know nipples down to your belly button. If you don't wear bras and you do, you know, basic, you know, just kind of jumping movements and you live your life mostly braless, you're going to have better boobs. Of course, you should be training, again, your, your chest and everything else, mm -hmm. ladies. But these are all things which are going to give those really nice boobs for a lot longer. Just so you guys know. Without the surgeries. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, set, set, and I know a lot of women will say, well, I can't. I have to wear bras, right? And there is a difference between a large um chested woman versus a small chested woman right like the breast size matters mm -hmm. so i'm not going to say that it's for all women and a lot of these things when we speak about that some people would be like well that doesn't apply to me or that doesn't work for me but it's also what you have become accustomed to so like you said the tissue will become more saggy right it will lose its um what do you what's the word like 
furnace, Elasticity. you know, basically. Yeah. So, and when I say, when I think of, you can use different kinds of support. So like a bralette, right? It's, it doesn't have that wire and the super constricting strap around your waist, like it affects your breathing. Same with workout gear. I always say with too tight of a yoga pant and like really those um, slimming kind of, I don't know, layers they put on underneath dresses. And I see this with my clients. They have so many health problems. Their lymph, their the rigidity in their spine, muscle tension, migraines, headache, um, anxiety. When you're that confined, your body is going to have elevated stress hormones. Just, just briefly hormones. on two things with the anxiety. The primary reason people have anxiety is because, as you well know, they're only vertically breathing, which means they're essentially using only a third yeah. of their lung capacity. They're not engaging their diaphragm or pelvic floor properly. They're not 360 degree breathing. Guys, if you just start breathing with your nose, five to six seconds in on the inhale, a real five to six seconds on the inhale and a real five to six seconds, either nose or mouth on the exhale. And you make sure you breathe into your belly. This is hard for most of you. Don't tell me it's not. This is hard for most of you. The way that you get out of this is lay on the floor, bend your legs like you're gonna be doing a crunch. So your lower back is flat on the ground. Put some form of a lightweight water bottle can, I don't know, your cat on your belly and make sure that that is going up and down while you are breathing, not your thoracic cavity or your chest. And then the second thing I wanted to say, guys, uh, back to boobs, just because, you know, I love them. Um, <clears throat> we got a guy here. You can see the spine, all this happy stuff. Don't worry too much about this, but this is what we want to look at. Now, picture this, but with small boobs, okay? So with flesh and then some small boobs. There's not going to be a lot of strain on these muscles back here. Mm -hmm. These muscles' job, once again, is to pull towards one another. Think like a bicep right here, kind of contracting. That's what their job is to do. There's not going to be a lot of reason for them to be doing that. However, if somebody has extremely large breast tissue, the issue is the spine is going to have to be constantly working to prevent that breast tissue and all that extra weight because this is a significant weight difference in some cases, anywhere from 5 to 30 pounds of a weight mm -hmm. difference. And if you have 30 pounds on the front of your chest, that is the same as if you're holding a 30 pound dumbbell against the front of your chest, men, for those of you guys who don't get it. Hold 30 pounds here and walk around all day. You'll see what I'm talking about with your back. So ladies, if you have this problem, it is critical you stop worrying about the cardio and crunches and you start worrying about training your erector spinal muscles so it's stronger and you restore your posture and you don't continuously have those back problems and you need the breast reduction surgery, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. I'll okay. shut up now. No, I couldn't agree more. It's that front loading and coming back. So usually the way I teach it, fascia, most people don't know, but it's that connective tissue. Um, it's a mesh that's connected through the whole body inside the muscle, around the muscle and connects all the tissues. So it's like if you pull a thread in a shirt, it travels. That's how the fascia works. So the most simple way I explain it in the anterior, which is the front and posterior in the back, if those two are balanced, your body is in that neutral position. But if you have that front loading, which I can do here, if you have heavy front loading, the posterior tissue is going to be eccentrically, constantly under stress and trying to pull up. And that's what the problem is with the rounded shoulder. Everything pulls in, the nipples go down, right? Everything is like this, and then the head goes here. And I always say, like, if you want to look better, if you want to have perkier boobs or whatever, like if guys want to have broader shoulders, you want to have good posture because aesthetically it looks better too, but it feels better. It looks better and it improves your health. Real, real quick, because I know a lot of people are going to make this mistake right now thinking this. Good posture does not mean throughout the day you are pulling your shoulders back and holding them in place. Thank good you. posture does not mean using one of those ridiculous shoulder devices to pull your shoulders <laughs> back and hold them in place. Those are both of those things. Listen to me when I say this very clearly. Both of those things are highly counterproductive and you do not want to do either one. The solution is very simple. You need to train your upper, middle, and lower trapezius correctly. If that is accomplished, those muscle groups, by the way, they connect on your spine and to your scapula or your shoulder blades. They are responsible for bringing your shoulder blades towards your spine. 
These are very important muscles. Everybody trains the chest. Nobody trains these muscles. The reason people do not train these muscles correctly is about, I'm gonna get biomechanical just for one second, uh, is because very simple, the arm bone does not connect to the scapula. Mm -hmm. And all of these muscles connect to the scapula, not the arm bone. So when people are doing bent over rear rows, any, any form of a rowing movement, a traditional rowing movement, you guys are not targeting this muscle. But you so, do this. <laughs> yeah, that's not targeting it. That's your rear delts. Yeah, you should know instead that. Instead of this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But even that's incorrect because it needs to be from a 45 degree angle for the correct resistance curve. Uh, but re regardless, guys, you want to train these correctly and traditional exercises don't do it. If you're curious or you haven't already seen it, my channel, you already know. Check out the exercises for the middle of lower trapezius. But again, there's a right way and there's a wrong way to do stuff. And if you do stuff the right way, it's a lot easier. You get better a lot faster. And oh, and one more note on fascia while I'm thinking of it. A very simple way to think about fascia, guys, is, you know, when you see a, a cat get up, they always do that cat stretch. You guys know what I'm talking about. They do it all the time. Now, they do that because cats are sleeping quite a bit. And you're sleeping. And when you're sleeping, you're not moving. And if you're not moving, this fascia, think little microscopic uh, nanobite spiders are running around all of your tissues covering them in a white cobweb it's very thin little tiny white cobwebs now during the night that happens every single night and also when you're sedentary during the day now the cat doing that stretching thing and also people like myself who wake up and engage in some form of movement stretching whatever in the morning right away you melt all of those cobwebs in the places you don't want them now, here's the thing, though. The reason that they're forming like that is because that's the position your body's in. So they're forming like that to keep your body in that position. They're supposed to do that. It's a good thing. You do want to melt them in the morning, though, when you stand up. Now, what happens to somebody, though, if they don't do this? If they stay forever laying down or forever forward, the fascia, the cobwebs, the spiders, they keep adding cobwebs, 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 cobwebs. Those cobwebs turn to concrete. They turn to glue. And then your fascia has no flexibility, no elasticity. Now you can't jump. Now you can't move. Now you can't do anything properly. Everything is compromised and you require years of daily consistent work to fix. Which, by the way, brings me to my next point. Is there a magical posture pill or is this something that must be done regularly? I always say key to good posture is awareness. It mm -hmm. has to start with awareness. So you have to help the person. And this is where it gets tricky with proprioception. I use walls as that reference point. Put them in neutral position, right? With the, with the spine and have them feel we're laying on the floor. What is neutral position? Because if they don't have that feedback, they don't know which points should be in alignment. And I love what you said, not bringing the shoulders back. I always say it's more important to bring shoulders down and simply from the side, the way I teach it, because if someone only do shoulders back, it actually exaggerates the forward head movement. Now the head is for more forward instead of getting shoulders down, lifted hard and getting the lift in the cervical because you want the head to be in alignment with the thoracic. And also the other thing I put down, what I say, the enemy of posture is gravity. It's like as if we walking around with a dumbbell all day long, and if we don't resist gravity and build that infrastructure within our body, we're going to constantly have those compressive forces. That's where we lose height. Mm -hmm. And we say, well, when I get older, I'm getting shorter. Well, that doesn't have to happen. If you know how to, you can see even in the screen, if I sit here versus here, mm -hmm. you know, in neutral. So it starts with a pelvis and uh, most people sit, now I'm not wearing the best pants, but most people sit here. They have or that. Lean forward toe. exaggeratedly on their phones or their elbows. And on they their sit knees here, right? Sort of and then they lose. Let me see here if I can do that. They pose your tilt here, and now the neck has to compensate even more. And this mm -hmm. is awful. <laughs> I can't, but most people like this feels good because we want to preserve energy, right? So that we want to lean into the joints. But now we're deteriorating the joints and putting a lot of compression versus if we start getting into the neutral, which is this is the foundation, right? This is going straight down. Now we have the ability to be the tallest we can be. And this is where you have the least amount of compression through mm -hmm. your joints. 
So I always say, you know, my definition of good posture is like, you want to have the least or zero joint compression. So when I do manual work, it's literally regaining the height. So the discs between the vertebrae can, can refill, right? Those are the little cushions that can, can absorb impact. But what I see also with fit people is that they don't have that ability to to brace against gravity so they're pounding even more and then they put the rack on their necks or weights in their hands and if they're going with the weights mm -hmm. they're losing a lot of height and that's when they get the lumbar uh, compression and low back pain they get hip pain oh, so not... joint well, decompression is a big one to I allow was, uh, the joints on the note of joint decompression real quick before i forget and also remind me uh dumbbell compression in a moment but just on the note of this i'd like to remind everybody that Science is real. We have evolved, as you guys have all heard me say many times. Um, so we know we have evolved, and we have evolved from creatures which used to swing in trees, so which used arboreum locomotion to actually move. Now, brachiation, or the movement of your arms such as this, the rear deltoid and the, um, the latissimus dorsal primarily, these are muscles which are, should be highly developed in most people. It's actually one of the reasons why we like the hourglass figure of a woman and a V-taper in a male. That's because if you have the V-taper, you have large latissimus dorsi and shoulders, which are responsible for this laborial loco uh, lo uh, arboreal locomotion. Excuse me. So this brachiation is something we've evolved to do. The reason so many of my, I mean, I couldn't even give you a number, but dozens and dozens and Dozens of people I help every year specifically come to me for their spine and their shoulder problems, which were created through squatting, deadlifting, bench pressing, rack pressing, leg pressing, farmer's walks, everything which I speak out against because they are highly ineffective exercises, which heavily compress your spine and damage your entire body with no need whatsoever. Going back to muscle loading using lever magnification principles and intelligence and in how you actually perform your exercises they're way faster they're way superior in every single regard there's no spinal compression there's no damage there's no need for any form of heavy weight because you're using lever magnification to your advantage and targeting muscles individually but i get a little bit off topic here sorry back to the point i was making which was dead hangs you should be able to, if you're a healthy person, you should easily be able to hold a bar and hang for at least 90 seconds, 30 seconds with one hand. If you can't do that, you're either overweight or your grip strength sucks for whatever reason, sleep, I mean, lack of exercise, and it could be a million things, but you get the idea. But dead hangs themselves, there's a reason I do a good five to 10 minutes a day of just hanging, literally just hanging, is because you have to try that i've never timed myself i don't even know if i can <laughs> I've, I've timed you 47 <laughs> seconds oh so, i'm sorry I to hung? reveal that yeah sorry to reveal that yeah sorry uh, but anyways <laughs> that's okay i've never just hung with you have I? I had your heels in the ground because you wouldn't be able to fully support your weight for that long but anyways if you're doing a dead hang guys your objective is to have your palms facing forward arms completely straight, you're going to allow your scapula to relax and your chin is going to be centered equally between both of your hands. You're going to stay there for as long as you can. Now, obviously, most people are going to have extreme difficulty doing this for a long period of time. Your objective in the beginning is perhaps to bend your knees slightly, so you're slightly decompressing. The objective is total time accrued, not time in a row. So if your objective is two minutes of dead hangs a day, perhaps do 10 second increments and do it every single day. Make sure you're consuming enough protein, your sleep hygiene is on point, et cetera. You get the idea. Um, but I just wanted to mention dead hangs because most people will do all, go to all kinds of crazy things to fix their spine uh, and their shoulders. But in reality, if you're doing simple things like dead hangs, uh, your shoulder joint, I don't want, that's a complex subject, but um, your shoulder joint and your spine will thank you. Let's just put it that way for doing dead hangs daily as much as you can. You don't have a bar, use your door. Use your door frame, use a tree branch, use your brain, people. Okay, this isn't hard stuff. Just hang from something. Well, we've it been comes doing it since we were freaking to, animals. Come on. It, it comes down to use your body. You know, we have so many frozen joints simply because we don't move. Hmm? That is the problem. Sedentary. All your joints should go full 
go through full range of motion. I want to say one thing before well, we, we had a, I was going to say, can we try to wrap up in some time, like the next five, 10 minutes here? Oh, I was going to say, I can wrap up right now. <laughs> no, no, just, I like to slowly wrap it up. And so let's try oh, to, come okay. to come to a conclusion with these things. Yeah, no, I just, I think that so many, and then we go to the doctor, right? We get a cortisone injection. We get a painkiller. We get an anti-inflammatory um, medication or something because we have joint pain and all the joint needs is to be moved proper and movement. mobilized, proper movement. full and range nutrition. of motion and nutrition. Uh, and even in strength that we have full range of motion so that it goes through that motion and that lets the joints stay healthy. Mm -hmm. um, the, the one thing I want to share, just a simple readjustment. I mean, it starts with awareness and we could have five hours of this or probably 50 hours or five days we could talk about posture. Uh, one simple adjustment that I teach my clients is to prevent the forward lean. Mm -hmm. So we work at screens, we lean into the people and that's not good for many reasons. We actually absorb more energy and we want to keep some exactly. We don't so like we it forward to give our attention to people or screens and we look forward and what happens back to what castle was saying the posterior tissues now are just grabbing and gripping and trying to hold you up to prevent you from falling forward right so all this is being strained that's why the symptoms are in the posterior tissues so then you go for body work i say don't rub more here you want to open this up you want to mm -hmm go to the root cause, which is the, the locked short muscles, right? So leaning forward is one and same with standing. I'll do a little quick. I think most people stand incorrectly. But, uh, here. So a lot of people stand towards like into their feet, the here and the hang in their pelvis and then collapse and then the forward head. I see this a lot and they lose a lot of height so simple tip, go back into the heels and allow the pelvis to be neutral and then lift up and stack that lateral plumb line, right? But everything just back into the heels now help the anterior and the posterior fascial lines to be more balanced versus here where the posterior has to grip so much and this is all weak, right? So that's where the stabilizer in the core. So those are the things, just shift your body weight literally back and it will feel like you're doing a standing plank because this is going to try to prevent you from falling back. But I'd rather have someone have toned anterior versus this mm -hmm. stuff. Well, I don't know again, if you agree with that. You probably could break that down more. <laughs> well, I, mean, I was going to say- So I think that's a simple thing because, you know, what you and I have talked about is when we try to explain this to people, when you go too in depth, whether it's science or anatomy, physiology, you lose a lot of people. So what I've learned over the years, I try to simplify it, like bring your body weight back into the heels because that's as much as they can absorb at the time. Then you can kind of like explain why, but that I've noticed like just being aware of sitting back helps you tremendously throughout the day, whether it's working at the desk or cooking or carrying your groceries like shift back so your anterior tissues can work a little bit more and then give give your back muscles some slack again i would say even keep it simpler than that people are really stupid so the easiest way to think about it is literally just guys think straight line with weights on it where are your weights on your body Pretty simple. We have a rib cage, a weight here. If you're a lady, as we mentioned, you have big boobs. So this has to be supported. And down here, you got your legs, etc. Problem is people are sitting all day. So once again, there's mm -hmm. psoas and this fascia train right here locks up. Psoas is responsible for lifting your upper leg, not your abs. Abs don't connect to your leg. Um, but anyways, so you just have to think keeping yourself upright. Going back to mnemonics and memory. Uh, if you've ever tried to pick up a severed human head, you would notice immediately that it wants to roll out of your hands. And that's because all of the weight of the head is from this point backwards. It's very back weighted. The reason for that is for good posture. The reason it's back weighted is because you have a muscle group right here called your sternoclamastoid, which is responsible for holding this part down a little bit, but you're counterbalanced with weight back here, pulling it back properly. So if you're a healthy human, this is the proper ratio you have. Your sternoclamastoid is the right length. Your head is balanced above yourself. Dropping below that, 
Your shoulders and collarbones form a nice straight line. A lot of people do not like to actually look at themselves in the mirror and actually understand what they're looking at. Guys, just think straight lines. Straight line, make a big X. Straight line again, just like the cross, but this is the Holy Church of Coach Coach Castle here. Um, so again, straight lines, straight lines. When you get to your pelvis, that's once again a straight line. You get to your legs, just think about evenly distributing your weight between both of your feet. When you get to your feet, think about stools with three legs. Evenly distribute the weight on the pinky toe, the base of the big toe, and the heel. If you can master those things, you're going to have pretty good posture. But again, there's no magic pill, and you have to do it slowly over time, being mindful throughout the day, just as you repair your breathing or you repair your diet or you repair an addiction or you change a habit, you must be mindful of it, which is where other things come into play, like having good nutrition, having good sleep, having uh, proper hormones, being able to meditate, not being stressed. You can't be mindful of all these things are going on. But again, uh, going back to mnemonics, could you turn around real quick? Turn around. Turn around. Uh, don't look at your desk. And what was your grocery list? Avocados, onions, and eggs. Oh, cool. I get it. Cool. All right. I just like to prove a point. That's the avocado is the most fun because I just saw that <laughs> smashing into the picture. <laughs> so it's just a very simple technique. That's all. Now, you That's should, good. if you're going to use it long term, you have to practice repetition, just like mm -hmm. with anything else. I don't really have to repeat too much anymore. But I just kind of occasionally while I'm in grocery line or something, I'll, I'll just go through my pallets and open some drawers and cupboards and look at some stuff and see what's still there just to kind of check on it. You know, I would love to get a glimpse of what's going on in your brain on a day to day basis. <laughs> it's a pretty common technique for people to study with, I think, and, and to learn stuff. And I thought, uh, but regardless, um, thank you so much for popping on the Posture Podcast. And we'll, uh, we'll chat more my soon, of course. <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll keep you updated with everything. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for coming on and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Thank you. A good life has a good purpose. Something that makes everything that you're doing worth it. Something with a bigger meaning that's under the surface. Because that's what's going to keep you working.